I'm a young gay man in my 20s with a high sex drive. As such I frequent grinder, scruff, etc. looking for opportunities to you know, have some fun. I have a thing for older men, too. I don't really care how old as long as they don't look like my grandpa. I live in a big city, but even so grinder and scruff can be pretty dry some days. A lot of the guys I'm into aren't attracted to me cause I'm a lot younger. I'm also not white or muscly so I don't get an abundance of attention on those apps in general. On those dry days the wise thing to do would be to nut quietly by myself and go to sleep peacefully, but like any other 20-something man, sometimes my second head takes over and decides that sex tonight is a life necessity. I don't always meet someone in public first but I'm pretty good at hooking up safely. I have a checklist of things that I will send to one of my best friends every time I'm meeting someone, screenshot of the online profile, all face pictures they gave me, a first name, their phone number if I have it, social media profiles if I have them, where we're meeting. I'll text them regular updates when I'm on the way over, when I've made it over, and whether or not the guy is the guy in the pictures. If we ever move locations I text them an exact address, apt, and room number immediately or turn my location sharing on. Once it looks like the dirty is about to start, I'll let them know a time by which I'll text that I'm safe. And my friends are pretty awesome so they look out for me. One thing to note, if a guy offers me a drink while I'm with them, I make sure it's in a sealed can or bottle, or they let me watch while they pour. Most people are actually very conscious and deliberate about this nowadays, it's nice. A couple months ago I figured I'd start proactively casting a wider net for those nights that the apps are dry. I joined this site online specifically catered to the gay older and younger crowd. Eventually I got a message from this guy. He sends me a kind of low residential picture of him in oversized glasses and a sweater slash button down combo. I read his profile and he's 71, enough for me to think that's old, and I can't quite tell if I'm attracted to him from the first photo. I message back asking for a second, and, good sign, he sends one over without fuss. Again a bit low resolution but without the glasses and I think yeah okay maybe. His profile says something about how he's from the UK, and he's quite tall, so I figure the British accent is tall daddy. It'll be novel at least. Reading further on, he prattles on about how he likes meeting people who are strong-willed and breaking them down to be completely submissive to him. Sounds hot. We exchange phone numbers and text on WhatsApp a bit. He seems a bit arrogant. He starts telling me people often say he looks like a movie star. He looks way better in real life. Apparently he chooses poor pictures intentionally so people get pleasantly surprised when they meet, and is telling me how he can tell that I'm smart by the way I text or something. Heard it all before, but I have a bit of a high tolerance for this brand of old man bullcrap posturing at this point. He lets me know a date he'll be coming in and staying in a hotel downtown, a month later. I figure I'll probably forget about him by then and never message him again. And then a month later rolls by, and it's another particularly dry night on the apps. I'm having a need for a little sex tonight, and I remember that guy I was talking to from that site. I hit him up on WhatsApp. Sure enough he's in town and tells me where he's staying. I tell him I'll be there in an hour. Are you disease free? He takes a while to respond. Eventually he says he is squeaky clean. We'll talk about it when you get here. I'm like, okay, sounds good. Text one of my friends the usual. I'm a little more nervous for this one just cause he seems a little odd and I kind of trust the apps a bit more weirdly, it's much easier to tell if someone is a legit person when they live in the same area as you. I figure it's a hotel, you can't be planning anything too awful for me. I show up to the hotel where he's standing in the lobby and lo and behold, he looks exactly like his pictures, just much less happy and a bit more, droopy. His shoulders hunch almost halfway up his neck, his torso is bent back at the waist a bit too much. He almost looks like he's imitating a confident cartoon character, but he is quite tall. He has a foot on me. I say hi. Two words to describe the way he came across, preoccupied and calculating. His eyes seemed to shift everywhere constantly, and when they landed on mine they were freakishly piercing. I don't remember if he said hi back, but the first thing he starts talking about is how that family over to the right is hiding some great unhappiness and will never be happy with themselves. I ask why do you say that? He says it's because they are giving so much attention to the kid and aren't talking to each other. I look over. Looks like a regular sister, little brother, and mom tired from the day of vacationing, waiting for their dad to finish up sorting something out at reception. By the way, he has a very strong American accent. Bummer. We walk to the elevators. 
The second thing he says to me is that I breathe from my lungs when I sleep and don't let my breath drop into my belly. I have some classical training as a performer, so I have a decent understanding of basic functions like that. Decent enough to try to forward the conversation with the absent-minded reply, no, I breathe low. Eyes lock on mine, a brief pause, only a subtle change in tone. You want to know how I know that? I look at the way your lower jaw rests now. It kind of has this unsightly protrusion from the bottom of the skull where it should be resting. That probably happens overnight, when you start breathing from your chest which makes that fat tongue of yours press up against your bottom teeth and deforms it. Um, no. I'm pretty sure I breathe low, when I sleep. Okay, no need to get defensive. I'm happy to be proven wrong. I've never experienced this level of agitation from anyone within the first two minutes of meeting them. I have been in emotionally manipulative relationships before so the feeling was familiar, and weirdly intense for a first meeting. My brain kind of goes on autopilot polite hookup mode and I figure maybe it'll be okay once we stop talking. He continues posturing as we ride up the elevator. He loves psychology and predicting how humans act apparently. We get off on his floor and approach his room. I quickly fire off the sweet number plus, he's a little odd, in a text to my friend. As he taps his keycard, he glances at me over his shoulder. You don't need to text someone my room number you know. Okay, well I just did. I'm a very trustworthy person. You have to trust me. Okay, I just do that with everyone I meet. The room is fairly normal, nothing too weird. His stuff is piled in a corner a bit haphazardly. Bed is made, lights are all on, and a normal hotel room. I see an open wine bottle on the desk. A glass of coke and a glass of white wine are pre-poured. I take off my jacket and sit on the edge of the bed. He sits on the desk chair. He starts quizzing me. Do you do this a lot? You asked if I was disease free. What are you expecting to happen here? Because I'm a squeaky clean guy, I don't have sex with people unless I'm in a relationship with them. The reason I ask is people who do this a lot tend to be quite dirty and slutty, and eventually it catches up to them. Listen, I can tell you're a smart guy. I can tell you're a strong-willed person. What I really like is when a strong-willed person like you becomes completely submissive to me. I like breaking them. At this point I realize he's not going to stop talking and feel like it might be a good idea to leave before having my pants down around him. But I feel frozen, on the verge of tears even. He is making me feel small, like a child. I see him smile a little. He likes it. I'm sufficiently creeped out. Look, I don't really think we're a match here, so I'm gonna go. Okay. You're feeling unsafe. No, I'm not, I just don't think we're on the same page. Let me know what I can do to make you feel safe. How about you have a drink? No thanks. Diet Coke or wine? I look at the pre-poured drinks on the desk. I get a gut feeling that I should not drink them. I stand up. No, I'm really fine, thank you. I quickly get my jacket on and jump into a polite, nice to meet you take care bye. On my way out the door he gave me wrong directions to get down to the subway from the hotel. Tell me smart people take that route. Stupid people take the long way. I say thanks and leave. I text my friend, holy crap, I'm safe. And I take my normal S subway route home, thank you very much. I pledge to stop letting my other mind think for me. Young Harrison Ford, let's not meet again. I have lots of creepy encounters during my travels, but I'll start with the most recent one. This is fairly long as I had two creepy encounters, one after the other. For clarification, I'm Asian woman with distinct Asian features, 5 feet 1 inch tall, and in my 20s. Last year, I went to Egypt with a big group of 40. For one night we stayed at this beautiful villa-style hotel on top of the mountains. The layout for this particular hotel is that there is a very long pool in the middle surrounded by small villas with about 20 rooms per villa. Our group got assigned to the farthest villa from the lobby. It was around 10 p.m. when I decided to go out for a walk to watch the stars and all. My grandma, who I was sharing the room with, was tired and went to sleep early so I went out by myself. I walked around the pool, enjoying the weather and the stars. I sat on one of the benches by the poolside. It was then I noticed one of the hotel staff, a bag porter who helped with our luggages when we checked in, approaching me. I thought nothing of it but he came by and made small conversations. I brushed it off as him just trying to be friendly and courteous to guests. He asked where we came from and I answered politely. What he said next gave me the creeps though. 
he said his friend was actually looking for a wife from my country. Uh, okay, dude. I laughed it off and lied that I am married. He asked where my husband was. I kind of panicked and told him my non-existent husband got left behind because he had work. He took out his phone and called someone but I guess the person he was calling wasn't picking up. He told me to wait but my spidey senses were tingling on overdrive. I had two options, to walk back to the villa as quickly as possible but risk letting this man know the room where I am staying at with my grandma or walk towards the well-lighted lobby hoping that there are people from my group still there. I stood up and started to walk fast to the lobby. The man was still trying to call someone on his phone and tried to call after me but I waved goodbye hurriedly. When I got to the lobby, I was relieved to see our tour leader, our Egyptian tour guide, and probably three ladies from our group still there. No more creepy hotel staff, or so I thought. In the hotel lobby they have a bunch of souvenir shops set up. One of the ladies I was close with, Brenda, was browsing inside the papyrus souvenir shop. Our guide warned us beforehand that the papyrus painting they sell at this hotel is fake or just generally low-quality tourist trap souvenirs. So I went inside the shop to tell Brenda about that, in case she forgot. Inside the shop was Brenda, me, and two salesmen. One of them was standing near the door and blocking the only means of exit. Brenda asked for my opinion between two paintings and this salesman standing in front of us told us that these paintings have a different pattern that glows in the dark. He asked us if we wanted to see it. I firmly said no before Brenda could answer. I had enough for the day and just wanted to go back to our room. However, this persistent salesman said something to this other man standing behind us, who then proceeded to close the door and the light switch. Crap, crap, crap. Maybe I'm just paranoid but I do not like the idea of being in a pitch dark room with two men I do not know. I could also sense that Brenda was panicking and she held onto my wrist. Like an angel in disguise, the door suddenly opened from outside and it was Brenda's aunt, who was also in the lobby with our tour guide. She shouted at us and asked what we were doing. She motioned for us to come out quickly. I swear I do not know what would have happened if Brenda's aunt didn't open the door at that time. She made a fuss over it and the rest of the group walked back to the villa together with our tour leader. On the way to the villa, Brenda's aunt asked us if anything happened, if our phones and wallets were still with us and all. We checked our belongings and everything was fine. No one followed us back to the villa and I was so happy that we were also checking out the next morning. So creepy porter and salesman at this hotel. If ever I find myself back at this hotel, let's not meet again. When I was in my early 20s and living in Chicago, I wasn't making much money. When I found this apartment, it was too good to be true. The top floor of a duplex with six rooms for $775 a month. The agent who showed me the apartment stressed to me that the landlords were very religious. I didn't have a problem with that even if it did sound a little ominous. The landlords were an elderly couple that lived downstairs. They seemed okay at first. When I saw them in the yard, they would smile at me. I took good care of the house. Then when they saw I was having my boyfriend over, things started to get really weird. One day I was in my office writing. I hear a knock at the door. I open it and it's the old lady from downstairs. Before I can say hello, she says, have you ever gotten an abortion? I shut the door in her face. No thanks. This was a colossal mistake. The house was laid out kind of weird. There was a door at the bottom of a flight of stairs that I thought led to a communal laundry room, but after accidentally opening it once I discovered it led directly into my landlord's living room. I unfortunately learned this the hard way. I was in my kitchen cooking. My boyfriend was at work and I was by myself when I heard what sounded like the click of a door. Okay, I say out loud. What the hell was that? I didn't really make the connection. It could have been the door that led into their living room. I walk into the hallway and look around. I don't see anyone at the end of the hallway. I poke my head into all of the rooms, nobody there. Then I look down the staircase leading to their house and the neighbor lady is standing there staring me down. I screamed. She flinched and stepped back into her apartment and swung the door shut. After that, every time I left the house, and I spent every possible moment out of the house after that incident, I would come back and something would have been moved. A window would be shut. Once, the shower was dripping and my towel was damp. 
I couldn't lock the door because since it was technically a door to their house, they were the only ones with the key. The knocking got so frequent, three or four times a day, that me and my boyfriend propped up an old mattress so we wouldn't have to hear it while we slept. The second to last straw was when I opened the door for work and the stairs were gone. I physically could not leave my house because there were no stairs. They had been dismantled and were sitting on their porch. I called them repeatedly but they didn't answer. Finally, their son came out of the house and explained that they were remodeling their porch. He told me I had to cut through their apartment downstairs. I descended the stairs and opened the door and they were both sitting at their filthy kitchen table, staring at me. The phone was in its cradle. They must have heard it ringing. They kept staring at me with this blank look on their faces. I crossed their kitchen and left out their back door. A few days later I came home from my job and noticed the bathroom floor was almost completely flooded, like somebody left a faucet on or the shower on. The old woman, seeing that I had come home, came upstairs and knocked, screaming at me that I had flooded the bathroom and that her son had to come fix it. I was so run down at this point that I just told her it was okay. Her son comes by a few hours later. He is plastered. I open the door and tell him that I need an hour or so before he comes and he picks something up and swings it at me. It was a massive wrench. I somehow duck out of the way and he stumbles over. I book it down the newly repaired stairs as quickly as possible and call the police. They come by and take down a complaint but claim since there was no physical contact they can't do anything. I learn later that the old couple has a daughter on the force. In the middle of the night, my boyfriend and several of his friends packed all of our stuff into a Chevy Astro. We lived in hotels and the van for a month until we found another house. They never attempted to contact us again. Old landlords, let's not meet again. So back in 2014, I was in a rush to move to another apartment, and there were not many available for the time frame I wanted it for, at least not in any good apartments and definitely not in good areas. I finally found a nice decent apartment with three rooms and moved in for the time being. At least I had a place to live in while looking for a better place to live. The suite was newly renovated so I was supposed to get new appliances as well. There had been a mistake with the fridge and the landlord told me that they would replace it ASAP and I should be expecting it within the first two weeks of moving in. About a month later, I got a knock on the door. I went to look out of the peephole and saw a man standing there with a piece of paper in his hand and another man behind him. Fridge. The man said from behind the door. I opened the door and saw the two men. The first man was the delivery guy, behind him stood a man who didn't really care about his appearance, and honestly looked like he had just crawled out of a dumpster. I thought he was just a helper. I let the man walk inside and place the fridge in the kitchen. The greasy man followed him inside and introduced himself to me. I am the new landlord, he said with a smile. Really? Where did the old one go? I asked. I was a bit startled as he looked like a freaking homeless guy. Who the hell hired him? Oh, she doesn't work here anymore. He said. Well, no doubt, I thought. The delivery guy then said bye and left. But the landlord didn't. Where are your parents? He asked me. I told him that I lived alone. Big mistake. No way. You look like your 15 girl. He said with a smile. Haha, ha, yeah, I get that a lot. What do you need a big place like this for? He asked. I just told him that I moved here temporarily. He walked over into the kitchen and started to open and close the fridge door. Just checking if everything is good, he said. I just nodded and leaned against the wall and watched. He then just stood there, looking at the fridge and then back to me. Why doesn't he freaking leave, I thought to myself. Then he said, you are really cute. Look at you standing there, you are so cute. I let out a laugh and thanked him. No red flags yet. He then said, I live on the first floor if you ever want to visit. We can hang out. I didn't know how to answer him. 
Um, haha, yeah, I mean. I don't T dash. Before I could say another word, he interrupted me. I have no friends, and I don't talk to my family, I am really lonely. Okay, red flags are going off now. I asked him why he didn't talk to his family. He brushed it off and changed topic quickly. Then he started walking to the door and repeated himself once again, don't forget. First floor, don't be a stranger. I followed him to the door and locked it when he left. I felt a bit uncomfortable, but soon forgot about it. About three days later, I got a phone call from a place I had applied to. I had landed a part-time job at Best Buy. This was my second job since I already had a job at an insurance company. I was excited to start work at Best Buy. I was hired in the tech department and I love computers. Before I go on, I work Monday through Friday from 9 to 5 at the insurance place and then three days a week at Best Buy, mostly in the evening, but it varied on weekends. So on the first day, I headed out of my apartment, took the elevator down, and was about to exit the front door when I heard a familiar voice. Hey. It was the landlord. Hey, what's up, I said. Not much. Where are you going? He asked. I ignored his question and just told him I needed to go and walked out of the door. I didn't need to drive to work because Best Buy was within walking distance. About three minutes into my walk, I noticed a gray car driving slowly beside me. I glanced over to see who it was, and it was the landlord. He rolled the passenger side down, where are you going? I told him that I was on my way to work, and that I was going to be late if I continued chatting. I said bye, and I continued walking a bit faster. Wait, let me take you, where do you work? No, it's alright. It's not far away. I work at Best Buy, I'll walk, I know, another dumb mistake, I shouldn't have told him where I worked. Come on, let me take you, I am heading to Tim Hortons anyway, need to get some coffee. Well, it wouldn't hurt if he dropped me off, I thought. He's going the same direction anyway. I hesitated a bit, but then accepted his offer. I got into his car, I know, dumb of me, and let him drive me to work. It was a very short ride but he did not fail to make me feel uncomfortable. When I finally got to my work's parking lot, I thanked him and I reached for the door to open it, but it didn't open. Hey, your door is locked. Oh, haha, ha. yeah, I have the habit to lock doors. Before I let you go, can you give me your number? I lied to him and told him that my phone wasn't working and that I was just using it as an iPod. My phone wasn't on vibrate and I was hoping to God that I wouldn't get a text message or any other notification. Okay, then let me give you my number, he said. He grabbed a piece of paper and wrote his number down. Give me a call, okay? Ha ha, sure. I said. When are you going to call me, he asked. I don't know, I'll call you when I get the chance to, I told him. What time are you done? I'll pick you up. I don't know. It's my first day. I don't know how long I'm going to be here for. I was hoping that he would fall for my lie. He unlocked the doors and I stepped out of the car. I thanked him again and walked towards the store. Before leaving, he once again shouted don't forget to call and then drove off. Jesus, what a creep that guy is. I threw the little paper with his number out and forgot about the whole situation again. The next day I was a little scared to take the elevator, since he always happened to be everywhere I was going. So I decided to take the stairs. It led to the back door and I was sure I wouldn't see him. I did this for about four days and never saw him. Great, this works, I thought. On the fourth night, I was sitting in the living room, watching YouTube videos on my laptop. It was around 10.30pm and was kind of dozing off when I heard a knock at the door. I wasn't expecting anyone. Who could it be? I sat quiet and didn't move, hoping they'd just go away. Another knock. I tiptoed to the door to look out of the peephole. It was the landlord again. Hey, are you there? Open up. Confused and tired, I opened the door. The conversation went as followed. Hey, what's up? Where the hell have you been? What do you mean? 
I don't see you leave for work anymore. Did you quit or something? No, I still go to work. I just have a weird schedule. You never called me. I was waiting for your call, and you never called. You promised. Sorry, I just never got the chance to. I work two jobs, so I'm pretty busy. I came to your work and asked for you, and they told me that no one by that name worked there. Did you lie to me? Did you lie to me about your name? I was caught off guard. I didn't know what to tell him. I had indeed lied to him about my name. But that wasn't what freaked me out. Why the hell had he gone to my work? You went to my work? Why? I asked a bit nervously. Because I didn't see you around, I wanted to know where you were, he said, irritated. I didn't respond. He then just stared at me for a moment, hoping that I'd invite him in. But there was no way in hell I was going to invite this guy in. I'm really tired. I need to work tomorrow. I'll see you around. Look, I need to talk to you. Can we talk? Honestly, I am really tired right now. Can this wait? Whatever, fine, he said while walking away, still muttering something under his breath. I shut the door and stayed up for a bit, afraid that he'd return. Luckily, he did not return and I could finally go to sleep. Another day of slavery was awaiting me the next day. So the next day came, I got ready for work again and decided to take the elevator. The elevator door opened and guess who was in there? Yup, it was him. He asked me if I needed a ride to work. I responded no. Are you sure? He asked. I told him once again that I didn't need a ride. And got out of the elevator and went to work. This went on for months. By this time, I had already mentioned him to my manager and my co-workers. They had told me that if I didn't show up for work one day, they'd call the police. Sometimes he'd see me walk out of the main door and he would drop everything he was doing to come after me, asking if I needed a ride. Other times he would ask if we could hang out and if he could take me on a date. Knocking at my door in the middle of the night was also a pretty common thing. One time he was in the middle of a conversation with another tenant. The tenant was complaining about something that had broken in his suite and that he needed him to fix it. The landlord told the tenant that he should go to his apartment and he would get his tools and follow quickly after. The tenant left, but he never went to get his tools. Instead, he followed me outside and offered me a ride to work again. I told him no and that he needed to do his job and help the tenant. He said he didn't give a crap about the tenant and that he just wanted to be around me. This creeped me out of course. I would also see him at work sometimes. My manager had given me permission to go to the back room and just get out of sight whenever he came in and looked for me, which he had done several times while I was at work. I caught him walking in once, scanning the entire store to see if he could spot me. But he didn't, so he just left. He also mentioned to me once that sometimes he wanted to kidnap me. He told me that he just wanted to take me away and keep me to himself. I remember when he said it. He looked like he was hesitating, as if he was going to act on it right away. I found it a bit alarming, but I wasn't too scared. I don't know why. I guess I didn't realize how much of a danger I was in at the time, which is odd. But I did play it cool, in case he was really going to try something. He would often say creepy things like that to me whenever he got the chance to talk to me, however I don't remember all of it. It's a bit fuzzy to me. Now you might ask why I hadn't called the police. Well, the police wouldn't have done anything since he had not caused any physical harm. So there would be no point in calling them. Also, I had no proof of these things happening, or the things he had said to me, other than him showing up to my work a few times. He would come to my work often to look for me if he didn't see me leave for work, or if he hadn't seen me in a couple of days. Or he would bang on my doors in the middle of the night asking me to open the door. I, of course, would ignore it. He had no way of reaching me anymore because it was now clear to him that I was avoiding him. A couple of weeks passed and I was awoken by the sound of a fire alarm going off. Oh crap dot that's right, there was supposed to be another fire drill today. It was my day off, so I quickly went to see if I still had the note to see what time they were going to enter the apartments. 
Maybe I still had some time to get ready and leave the apartment, since the landlord usually comes in with the person who checks the alarm. I couldn't find the note. I got ready as fast as I could, and I was halfway done when there was a knock at my door. Crap, I thought. I opened the door and there was the guy for the alarm, and the landlord. They both walked in, the landlord didn't say a word to me. The guy checked the alarm and then said it was good, and they both left. I felt relieved. That went well. Right? Wrong. Not even a minute passed and I heard another knock at my door. Hey, it's me. Can you open up for a second? I ignored it. Louder knocks. Hey, man, I know you are in there. Stop playing with me. I need to tell you something. Come on, open up. This continued for about two minutes. When it was finally silent again. I had enough of this freaking guy. I had to do something about this. That night, I was supposed to go to my friend's house to hang out with her and also to return her laptop. She had given it to me to reinstall Windows. I got ready and left my apartment at around 11 p.m. It was really nice out and I wanted to walk to her house. It was a long walk, but I really love walking. I took the elevator down and when the elevator opened, I saw him standing by his door. He hadn't seen me yet so I had to act fast. Either get back into the elevator or sprint for the front door. In a split decision, I went for the front doors. But sadly, he noticed me. I heard heavy footsteps running behind. Before I go on with the story, I want to say that when you leave the front doors, you see a big parking lot. In order to leave the apartment complex, you need to walk around the building. So basically, the front doors are pretty much the back of the building, and the back doors are the front. I know, it's weird. Anyhow, when I got outside, I ran halfway around the building and looked behind me. There was no one there. I stopped running and started walking again. But something inside me told me to keep running. Little did I know that the reason why the footsteps behind me had stopped was because he had gone to the back doors to catch me there. When I got to the other side of the building, I saw that he had made it halfway around the back side of the building, which is the front. I started running again and he started running after me. He chased me for about two blocks while we both would occasionally stop to catch our breaths. I was close to the main road when I stopped running. My lungs were burning, I couldn't run anymore. Whatever happened next, I had to fight. He caught on. Out of breath, he said, stop, stop man, you are killing me. Stop doing this to me. I looked in shock didn't say a word still trying to catch my breath why are you doing this to me man he said letting out a small cry for the first time I saw a look of sadness mixed with anger stop following me I yelled what the hell do you want please that don't go please come with me let's talk he pleaded talk about what he was still trying to catch his breath I didn't care anymore, I was shaking, tired, and just wanted to see my friend. I didn't even make out what he said because of the adrenaline, I started walking again, turning around every two seconds to see if he was following me. But he wasn't, he just watched me walk away. And that is the last time I saw him. Creepy landlord, please, let's not ever meet again. I was called out on an emergency dive on the 12th of April. 2013. Back then I usually did forensic and rescue dives, but this was something different entirely. Usually when I get called out, time is a definite and measurable factor. For example, someone could be in mortal danger, or there is a time-sensitive object that needs to be retrieved. This time, the objective wasn't clear. My first impression was that this was something catastrophic. I was called up in the middle of the night with no warning and there was talk of a measurable geological event. I wasn't briefed and every person involved just stonewalled me with a barrage of I don't know s. I knew pretty much anyone who worked on my level statewide, but these people were just gray-faced anonymous nobodies. They drove me all the way to Greenbrier Valley, WV. Just imagine this middle of nowhere dirt road covered by government-issued vehicles. 
Off the top of my head, I registered people from the USAIS, United States Army Corps of Engineers, the NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, the USGS, United States Geological Survey, and the WVDNR, West Virginia Division of Natural Resources. Those were just the ones I recognized, but at least half of the vehicles were unmarked or straight-up lies. I swear, one of them claimed to be a goddamn catering business. I was pushed through a crowd of people. Some were screaming at their phones, others were screaming at one another. There was this one red-faced middle-aged man almost crying with frustration at a young woman. He kept waving his papers at her, and all she did was nod and smile. Somewhere along the line people started asking me questions. What's the ETA on your prep? Did you bring your own gear? Are you signed in? Where's the sign-in? There were other people I'd worked with on site. There was Garrett, who just turned 44, and Nora. I'd worked with Nora on a couple of rescue dives, but nothing on this scale. There were a few faces in the crowd that I vaguely recognized, but Garrett and Nora stood out. They were already suiting up. They were preparing for a cold dive and checking their equipment. I had some papers shoved in my hands. As I signed in, I could see a bubble of people forming around one of the USACE representatives and an older woman in a professional pantsuit. You got 12 hours, said the woman in the pantsuit. Not a second longer. This is private property. We can stall, said the representative. We can drag you through the courts. Go ahead. I'm sure the judge is eager to hear you explain your sudden interest in our property. We don't have to explain crap, you freaking vulture. In 12 hours, you will be considered trespassers. We will bring in private security, and you'll be escorted off the premise. The woman in the pantsuit took a step forward, stabbing at the USACE representative with a stack of papers. Our congressman is eager to have you defunded, you freaking dolt. As the conversation died down, the representative was left seething in the dirt. She was fuming, and no one dared approach her. After a few seconds, she stormed off. Freaking hatchet man, someone in the crowd whispered as the woman in the pantsuit walked off. Goddamn war criminals. Garrett waved me over, and I sat down on a log next to him. I started to dress down. Someone needs to talk to me, I said. Someone tell me what's going on. Earthquake, said Nora. Not a big one, but... Yeah. What the EFF does this have to do with an earthquake? It's the lake, said Garrett. You'll see. Still putting on my gear, we were pushed forward. They took me by the arm and forced me on, drowning me in questions along the way. When we finally stepped through a forest clearing, what was supposed to be a small lake opened up to us. Except it wasn't a lake anymore. The water had been drained, leaving only a bed of dirt behind. Hundreds of seagulls picking at dying fish in a cacophony of screeches. Men in hazmat suits were trying to chase them off, but only ended up slipping back and forth in the mud. In the middle of the drained lake was a hole, about six by four feet. It was the only space that still retained water. There were tables set up around it, along with security tape and red flags. About a dozen people spread out around a dozen laptops, making calculations and checking measurements. An anonymous woman popped up next to us, pushing us forward. I could sense the warmth of the sun on the horizon about an hour from dawn. We're doing a blind dive, she said. We need you to be in constant communication with us about anything you see. You'll be going in within the hour. We're not doing that, said Garrett. There's no emergency here. There's no dash suddenly, Garrett came tumbling into the mud. The woman had pushed him. You're doing this, she snarled. You're freaking doing this. We're not doing anything until we get dash. You see that, she interrupted Garrett pointing to the army of vehicles. That right there is a sworn freaking oath that I will burn your goddamn life to the ground, you cocky jerk. Now you do this, or you'll never touch a freaking glass of water again. Nora helped Garrett up, and we hurried down to the hole. I could barely hear anything over the feasting seagulls. 
I was thankful for the rubber mask keeping me from the smell of dead fish. Two men tried their best to prep the basics, but we had nothing. There was basically no dive plan. No idea about the temperature, the stability, the currents, nothing. These people were completely clueless. The only thing they could answer was the size of what we were getting into. The small quake had revealed a sprawling cave system, which the lake water had drained into. Roughly 350 feet wide and 700 feet deep. All underground. I tried my best to wrap my head around it. We tested our co-linked masks and settled on individual tracking lines. We'd be diving for 20 minutes, then set aside 25 for resurfacing and depressurizing. We would be having air tanks on rotation and constant contact with those up at the control. At the slightest side of trouble, we'd bail, no questions asked. There was no way we'd go in blind for any longer than that. We agreed on resurfacing if there was a comms malfunction, even though we all knew hand signals by heart. This couldn't go wrong on any level. We were still setting up when we were given hand chisels and self-sealing bags. We want samples of everything, they told us. Everything. Let's try to put this into perspective. At this point, we barely knew anything. An earthquake had revealed a cave system on some kind of company property. The size and depth of this was unfathomable. In 12 hours, we would be kicked off the site, possibly so they could perform their own tests. This cave system had been completely isolated, possibly for tens of thousands of years. Maybe hundreds. Someone even kept throwing around the term Karu Ice Age, but that seemed improbable. This place would either be a unique resource or a complete waste of time. We were at least one to two hours in on the countdown when we first dipped our toes in the water. It was much colder than anticipated. As I sat on the edge, dangling my feet in the murky water, one of the on-site technicians double-checked my air tanks. Exciting, isn't it? He smiled. I'm jealous. How come? You get to explore, he chuckled. An actual space that no human eyes have ever seen before. That's not always a good thing, nodded Nora. And there's plenty of that on the ocean floor. We took that first plunge. I could barely see anything because of the mud and the reeds, so we just went straight down. The water got colder with every foot, and little dust particles whizzing past me made it feel like driving through a rainstorm. As we got further down, this sense of unease settled in my chest. I'd never been so ill-prepared for a dive, and this was beyond anything I'd ever experienced. There's a reason why people are advised to stay out of underwater caves. This was, in more ways than one, uncharted waters. We went down about 25 feet, where we finally hit rock bottom. The cave wall was rough and sharp, with some kind of thin crystal layer. Salt, I figured. Nora got a sample as anonymous voices buzzed in our ears. I could barely make out half of it. Go deeper, a voice came through. There's nothing up there. We mapped out three different tunnels leading further down. The first one we checked turned out to be so thin my equipment wrist snagging on the walls. We backed out and tried another tunnel until we found one large enough for us to comfortable move through. Still, it was more crawling than swimming. Turtle 1, we're getting seismic, a voice came through. Please respond. Stand by, equalizing. I could feel the mechanism from the camera on my shoulder whirring. Garrett came through on the local channel. No way the signal sticks, he sighed. Freaking granite and quartz. This is pointless. Resurface in 10, I said. Check for samples in the cracks. The tunnel lead us to a small cave. The water was less murky, but the space was only about 15 by 20 feet and at most 6 feet high. It was enough for us to regroup, check our tethers, and take a few samples. Nora found some kind of transparent goo lining a crack in the wall, while Garrett tried to chisel off a piece of the granite. I thought I saw something shimmering, but it was just the light from my camera reflecting off a piece of quartz. I grabbed it though, I couldn't come up empty-handed. Once our time was up, we came back up for air. We were slow and methodical, but we were getting results. 
There was no way we'd reach the bottom in 12 hours, but we figured we could get something interesting, given enough dives. When we came back up, there was at least 50 people standing in a circle to look at us. Men in hazmat suits brought coolers for us to put the samples in, and two technicians were working on a hookah air hose system. We took a short break to wait for them to finish it, change up our air tanks, and plan our second dive. This time, we could go deeper. The air hoses could reach 60 feet, but they were already working on an extension. Still, Garrett insisted on refreshing our air tanks as well, just in case. As we hooked up the air hoses, the stiff chemical air from our tanks was exchanged with this musky forest breeze, stinking of dead fish and mud. There was also a little whiff of diesel from one of the on-site generators. As we dove back into the murky waters, we headed straight for the tunnels. This time we were going deeper. Past the reeds, past the mud. We mapped out three more tunnels going further and further down. We moved carefully, our new air hoses working as tethers. But it didn't take long for us to reach the limit. Nora called it in. Surface control, we need a longer line. No response. We waited for a moment, but there was nothing on the other end. Timeways, it was probably around the break of dawn. Just like Garrett had said, we'd gone too deep to hold a solid signal. I can go up and relay, said Garrett. Or we could just tug and hope for the best. I'm not tugging on an air hose, chuckled Nora. This is blank enough. What? You hearing this? Little bursts of static. The camera on my shoulder whirred like crazy. Nora gave me the hand signal for resurfacing and took point. Garrett and I followed. Time to bail. There was a deep rumbling sound coming from beneath. It felt like the ground itself was trying to start a diesel motor, cycles of rumbling, making cracks in the walls. Something big was happening, and we had to get out now. I could feel my breath shortening as my body realized that air was no longer a certainty. The moment Nora got through the first tunnel, I saw the rock wall shift. Solid knife-sharp granite moved with the ease of a child smacking a balloon. To the sound of a deafening thunderstorm, the tunnel collapsed above us, the air hoses got cut, and Nora's foot was crushed into a pulp. Together they sprayed air and bone fragments into the water, as the sound of our collapsing world got loud enough to rattle my bones. Parts of a blood-curdling screech came through our comms as the water started to move. We were being sucked down. I protected my head as I was tossed around the tunnels, further and further down. My air tank clinked against the wall. I instinctively gasped for air, but I could feel water rushing into my mask. There was no air supply on the other end, the hose was cut clean. The walls rushed past me. I slammed my shoulder, my knee, my thigh, my shoulder. At one point, I smacked the back of my head, and I could feel my body temperature shift. It was a wound, but not a deep one. Somewhere in the chaos, I felt the camera on my shoulder come loose, and I got into a roll. I spun out of control and lost all sense of distance. It wasn't just a few seconds of suction either, it was a significant amount of time. My world spun and bashed me into the rocks over and over and over. I could feel blood leaving my body, and I was getting cold. Colder and colder, but I couldn't tell if it was blood loss or the water. The word disoriented doesn't begin to describe it. At some point, it just stopped. I was floating in this endless pool of darkness. A black, bottomless ocean. I couldn't tell what was up and what was down anymore. I tried to move upwards, but it didn't feel right. Not only did my arm refuse to move, but there was too much resistance. It took me a few seconds to realize I was trying to swim downwards, I was upside down. There was water pooling in my mask. I could feel it just under my mouth. I could see little air bubbles popping, and I had to spit to keep my mouth clear. It had a strange sugary taste, mixed with iron. But most of it was blood. Something grabbed me. My first instinct was to fight, but I couldn't. I'd strained my arm, and my left foot was dislocated. I was shivering, and I could see a long gash across my thigh. That was just at the limit of what my mask light could pick up. I couldn't even see my feet. 
Garrett came into focus. He made a hand movement that I didn't recognize. A closed fist, with fingers pushing outwards. A push. An exhale? Right. I exhaled, hard, pushing out the water in my mask. The next second, Garrett connected my air tank to my mask. For a moment, we just looked at one another. He had a bad cut just above his right eye, and it was bleeding into his mask. Our comms were dead, we had to rely on hand signals. Garrett put a hand on my cheek and checked my mask for cracks. It seemed okay. He gave me the signal for okay, and I responded in kind. I was not okay, but I was well enough to move, if a bit slower. We moved carefully and calmly. There was no way to tell how far down we were, and we had to be careful to preserve our air. At most, we had a little less than an hour of air if we could keep steady. Probably a lot less, though. Garrett and I held hands, slowly going upwards. It felt right. I was oriented. We kept moving, but it felt like we hadn't moved at all. The water was still black, and nothing changed. But at one point, Garrett suddenly stopped. I moved up next to him and followed his eyes. He looked upwards. Little shimmers in the water. Fish? A school of dozens of little fish. They were about four inches long and azure blue. They were completely eyeless with their entire face covered in a thick octopus-like beak. They avoided us to the best of their ability, shooting past at an amazing speed. Still, they were close enough for Garrett to poke them if he wanted to. He didn't, and neither did I. Whatever these were, they were native to the area. They could be venomous. Garrett tightened his grip on my hand, and we kept moving upwards. After ten minutes of going in a straight line, we came to a full stop. A solid rock ceiling. Just a wall, without the hint of an opening or tunnel. It occurred to me that we might have come down horizontally through a side passage. If that was the case, we were doing the human equivalent of a fly buzzing against a window, trying to get out. We looked around, but the ceiling was almost completely flat. There was no telling where we ought to go. Still, I had to try and keep calm. Panicking would just kill us faster. But even with this seemingly endlessly large space, I'd never felt so trapped in my entire life. I held my breath, trying to slow the shivers. Garrett reached for his chisel. Poking at the wall, he managed to dislodge a few kernels of granite. He stared at them, looking for any sign of movement. Apart from sinking, they were slightly drifting to our left. Of course. There was a current. I was simultaneously trying to ignore how much time had passed, and at the same time counting the seconds. Garrett's diving watch was busted, and mine hadn't been properly reset before the second dive. It was still on time for our first. This was exactly the kind of crap I'd wanted to avoid, but we'd been so stressed to get back in. At one point, the ceiling started to curve. And there, finally, was an opening. It seemed to lead upwards. We followed it, squeezing through a tight space where I had to exhale to pass through. Shimmying forward, breathlessly, inch by inch. Tons of unstable rock pressing on my aching chest. Then, we broke through the surface. Just like that. We weren't topside, this was an air pocket. It was large enough to fit us both, as long as we squatted a bit. There was a tunnel leading us further, but we decided to catch our breaths. I was the first to shut off my air and clean out my mask, but Garrett was quick to follow. Finally, we could speak freely. Stale, sugary sweet air filled our lungs. I coughed, making my ribs ache even more. The, uh, the lake water, gasped Garrett. It hadn't settled. With the, uh, the temperature shift from the, uh, the sunrise. That, that heated it. Got it moving. So where? How deep? Least, uh, least 300 feet. At least. And that's just, that's just straight down. Nora, did you dash? No, said Garrett, shaking his head. It closed. She might be trapped up there, but at least she won't drown. 
I nodded, gently massaging my foot. I was gonna have to pop it back into place, but just touching my skin sent bolts of pain up my shin bone. You could wait, he said. You're hurt. I'm not dying here. Good. We caught our breaths and checked our equipment. We had about three quarters of our tanks left, so we were doing pretty good. We had some cuts and bruises, some that might need stitching. Nothing urgent, but it might get bad if left untreated. Who knew what kind of bacteria was down there? I couldn't stop shivering, and Garrett was getting worried. He kept asking if I was sleepy. Honestly? I could feel it. There was something there. Eyelids growing heavy as my lungs strained against my ribs. We got back down underwater, our equipment cleaned and secured. The tunnels were slowly widening, allowing us to crawl forward. There were a few intersections, and we did our best to map where we'd gone. I had some remaining scraps from the ripped air hose that we pushed into cracks in the wall, sort of marking our path like breadcrumbs. At the very least, we could get back to the air pocket if necessary. We went down a few tunnels, only to be met with a series of dead ends. It was a goddamn labyrinth, and my heart sank with every stop. When we finally found a path going forward, we had a difficult choice to make. We could circle back and regroup or push forward and save some time. Every minute moving backwards would be a loss, but every minute forward could be a death sentence. Garrett squeezed my hand, looking for some kind of guidance. I signed forward. The tunnel opened into a vertical shaft, going straight up. I could feel a slight rush of water, gently pushing us back down. It was only for a moment, but it made me realize that the current was getting stronger. Suddenly, the water started to shimmer. Hundreds of azure-colored fish rushed past us, down into the depths of the tunnels. Maybe they followed the current. Either way, they had to come from somewhere, so we pushed forward. Garrett squeezed my hand in celebration. There was another set of tunnels in the ceiling, branching into several paths. They all looked deep enough to lead somewhere, so we just picked one at random. I couldn't mark our path any further, I had nothing left to leave behind. We kept going upwards until Garrett suddenly stopped. There was something shimmering in the tunnel ahead. Some kind of gemstone, or quartz. They reflected the lights of our masks. Another dead end. Or eyes. These. Nightmare orbs. Predatory and unfeeling. An unthinking creature, incapable of seeing me as a person. For that one second, I was nothing but meat. It came out of the dark. It had these long bone-like arms, like a rubbery spider monkey needle-sharp teeth, made for stripping flesh from bone. It didn't swim, it crawled along the rocky walls. It was fast. Fast enough to catch little azure fish. It was large, but that didn't slow it down. It could barely squeeze through the tunnel, while Garrett and I could move freely. We were never meant to meet that thing. Never. To this day, I can't look down dark corridors. I can imagine those arms reaching out for me. I ignored every safety precaution I'd ever known. I rushed. I huffed. I screamed. I crawled, kicked, and forced myself back down as fast as humanly possible. I didn't care about the searing pain in my foot, I just had to keep going. All I could feel was the water moving behind me, as every sudden movement transferred into waves pushing against my aching limbs. But I didn't care. At that moment, I didn't care about anything but getting away. At the mouth of the tunnel, I turned around for a brief second, only to see Garrett's wide eyes staring back at me. In that moment, I could tell what he was thinking. He realized that he was about to die. Long fingers wrapped around him as his right arm was ripped from the socket. I could feel the snap reverberating through the tunnel. Vibrations from his death screams reached me, but all I could hear was my own panicked breathing. I remember flashes of shimmering azure as I fled down tunnel after tunnel after tunnel. Didn't see a single marker. Every bump of the foot made my eyes tear up, and I could feel a sore starting to build around the edge of my nose from the crying. There was another air pocket, but I just kept pushing forward. I had no idea where I was, but I could just feel those dark eyes looking for me. 
arms reaching for me. The air in my tank started to feel strange. Warm. Panicked, I kept going forward. When I finally came to another air pocket, I tore my mask off and shut the air tank. Everything tasted blood and salt, and I couldn't stop crying. It was just this small space, just big enough for my head to fit if I tilted it right. The light on my mask was dying. It had started to flicker. If I held it at the right angle, it was fine, but it was just a matter of time. I stayed there for at least 10 minutes, just trying to breathe. I was lost and cold. There was no telling how long I'd been down there. I couldn't even tell how much air I had left in the tank, but it wasn't much. If I wanted to move, I had to ration it. But I couldn't move without it. There was no way I'd be lucky to find another air pocket within. What, a minute of free diving? But I couldn't stay there. I didn't trust a single person up there. There were no rescue parties coming down here anytime soon. Even if they wanted to, could they? And even without a predator stalking these tunnels, I was going to freeze to death. And I was still bleeding. Wait. Bleeding. Crap. My pulse rose as I felt something shift. A pressure in the tunnel underneath. There was no way I could move fast enough, I just had to hope against hope it wouldn't find me. Maybe it didn't hunt like a shark. I held my breath and felt strokes of movement in the water. It was moving this way. I closed my eyes so hard my head started to spin. Tears trickled out of my eyes, making little plopping noises as they hit the surface of the water. It was barely audible, but to me it felt like hammer blows. The stroke stopped. It was close. I carefully opened my eyes to look down, but everything was dark. My mask light had given up. Moments later, the strokes continued past me. Maybe it wasn't used to hunting humans. Or maybe it was taking its prey back to the nest. When I could no longer feel the strokes, I exhaled, coughing violently. My mouth tasted blood. There was no choice left, I had to keep going with what little I had. I secured my mask and let my hands rest in the water for a moment. Just floating around in that little space was unlike anything I'd ever experienced before. It was such an alien, primal feeling. I'd been in trouble before, but nothing like that. Nothing even remotely like that. I slowed my breathing and took the plunge. To my surprise, there was one strange sensation I hadn't noticed. When the lights were off, it was easier to sense the current. Maybe it was a rely on other senses kind of thing, but it was much clearer. Even in the dark, I could feel the right way for me to go. A circulation of some kind, coming from above. As I came to a branching tunnel, it was a bit harder to tell where I was supposed to go. I decided to just keep going up, so I did. The current was getting stronger, and all of a sudden, I breached into another air pocket. But I could hear something, a metallic clinking. It didn't take me long to find it. Garrett's air tank. On one hand, I was incredibly lucky. On the other hand, that thing was close. Really close. I still had a little juice left in my tank, so I hobbled forward. This air pocket was large, more like a cavern. Ankle-deep water forcing me to walk and actually feel my body weight. I've never felt so heavy in all my life, and the equipment didn't help. I was so tired. I could easily have lied down and just died or slept whatever came first instead i pushed on with an extra tank in hand i kept going further and further up i started to hold my breath for as long as i could using only what little air i had when absolutely necessary i could feel more of those little fishing rushing past me sometimes with me sometimes towards me it dawned on me that they might be fleeing a pursuing predator and that I was an idiot for not following them. Then again, they might just be following the current. There was no way to tell. I must have flailed around through caves, passages, and tunnels for hours, using every air pocket I could find and eventually just ditching my tank. All I had left was what scraps remained in Garrett's tank. Every feat started to feel like a death sentence, like I was digging my own grave. Maybe if we just stayed put in the first place, someone would have found us. 
Maybe being proactive was the wrong move. I was going upwards when I felt the air in Garrett's tank start to go bad. When I managed to breach into yet another air pocket, I just threw it aside. This was it. This was the end of the line. The tank clanged against the sides of the cave, and somewhere further in, I heard a noise. A little gasp. Something had heard me. I stuck myself to the wall as I heard large wet feet slapping against the cave floor. It had this strange frog-like breath, like air pushing against a membrane. H-N-N-N-G, H-N-N-N-G, H-N-N-N-G. I was standing in a painful angle, putting all my weight on my healthy foot. It had stopped. It listened. Blood, dripping from my arm, plopped against the water. Luckily, it didn't hear me, or care. Instead, I heard a bone snap like a carrot. Then, the sound of gnawing and eager suckling. I must have stood there, paralyzed, for at least half an hour. Then I heard it go down a side tunnel and disappear into the deep. This was my shot. I hobbled away, only to step on something. A partly devoured foot. From that point on, it was just systematic and careful plunges. Follow the current for 30 seconds. If I couldn't feel a way forward, I turned back, caught my breath, and tried a different path. I was holding my breath so much that my chest had started to ache more than my foot. Still, I was making progress. Finally, I came to this large vertical chute. I felt a rush going upwards. There had to be something. Anything. I held my breath for as long as I could, waiting for the surface, the air pocket. But this time, there was nothing. Dead end. I just slammed into a smooth surface, knocking myself over the head. A part of me wanted to scream so bad that air pushed out of my lungs. I could feel a cramp in my leg. Pain as my body retched and turned. But the surface was smooth. Unnaturally so. Almost metallic. I pounded it with my fist. It was thin, but heavy. Definitely metallic. But with every pounding fist, I could feel something else move. Something was coming up from below. It found me. It started with a tickle against my good leg. These little fingers tenderly wrapping themselves around my ankle, ready to pull me down. I didn't let it. I kicked, crawled, pushed myself upwards, and pounded the metal. A cramp in my arm forced me to scream. Something grabbed me from below, pulling me down at least four feet before I managed to kick myself loose. Gaining momentum, I flung myself upward, again crashing into the metal surface. But this time, it buckled. Just an inch, but it buckled. Suddenly, there was light. Air. And whatever reached for me recoiled in fear. For men had moved what looked like a makeshift manhole cover out of the way, and they pulled me up. I didn't even notice I was breathing. I just forced air into my lungs so I could keep screaming. And screaming. And screaming. Turns out, Nora made it to the surface. She'd lost a foot, but she'd made it. She'd been airlifted out, and the entry was sealed. They tried to get another diving team, but there was no one else around. If they'd had more time, they'd have flown out another crew of four from Minnesota. I was down there for a total of nine hours and 37 minutes. I had to sign a contract not to speak about this for 10 years. That time is up, and now I'm telling you what I know. Garrett died down there, and Nora was permanently maimed. I like to consider myself lucky, but I didn't come out of this unscathed either. I don't want to go into detail, but there are wounds that isn't as easily seen as a missing foot. That space was bought by this investment company called Hatchet. I'm pretty sure they're still operating there today. I've seen the chain-linked fences and the warning signs. Not to mention the armed guards. I've since moved on from diving. I can barely swim in a pool anymore. And honestly, I'm fine with that. 